Okay, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Peter Robinson and today I'm going to talk about cross-chain and bridges. Um, so it's me presenting, so I guess I can introduce myself. I'm a technical director and applied cryptographer at Consensus and um, the area that I look at in particular is cross-chain and bridges. I'm also the co-chair of the um, Enterprise Ethereum Alliance's cross-chain interoperability working group. Um, and um, yeah, so let's share my slides. Okay, so um, cross-chain bridges or DeFi bridges or chain bridges, take your pick. So lots of people have reviewed these slides and um, provided helpful comments. So thank you to all of them. And this is a picture of a bridge. Um, and um, as you can see, um, there's a lot that's happened to that bridge over time. And it was complex when they built it. And it's built on, you know, foundations. You know, that's not built on raw earth. There's a lot of work has gone into what goes underneath. And um, in fact, that one's even got three arches, so or four arches. And so you can almost um, view it as going across multiple areas, multiple um, bits of land. And so people have had to carefully design that bridge. Um, and so similarly, blockchain bridges are like this, where you've got, they're complex, there's a lot of design that goes in, and they are based on the underlying blockchains as well. Another interesting aspect of this bridge is you can see that there's that um, darker bit. I don't know if you'll be able to see my mouse moving around, where um, you can see that um, bits have been tacked onto the bridge um, partway through. And so obviously there was some maintenance needed. And I think that's an interesting one to think through that, um, that bridges are likely to need a bit of maintenance from time to time. So today I've got a big um, lot of topics to cover. And the first one is really trying to define what a bridge is. And then I'm going to talk about um, the protocol stack and the parts of the protocol stack. And then have talked about a few of the operations to think about, such as security, scalability, fees. Um, and I'll talk about standardization. And then we can have some questions to think through um, at the end of the talk. So, what is a bridge? So, a bridge allows you to swap assets um, from one. Um, blockchain to another. So you might have some assets on one chain that you want to swap with someone for some assets on a different chain, or maybe you want to be able to transfer the assets to the other chain. So swapping and transferring are similar but different. So transferring, you're get, taking something from one blockchain and getting it to the other. The other one is saying that, look, I'll, I'll give you some assets on my chain, on this chain, for assets on the other chain. Another thing that cross-chain and bridges can do is allow you to communicate arbitrary data or arbitrary messages. Or another feature is that you could have function calls that execute across the chain. So you can have business logic across the blockchains. And so, as I said, that a bridge is known by a range of different um, terms and they're all approximately the same thing um, and I don't think there are good fixed definitions of any of them. So when someone's saying a token bridge or a DeFi bridge is just a bridge. So why would you want to move value from one blockchain to another? So say if you're using Ethereum mainnet, um, you'll know that the transaction fees are quite high because it's a popular blockchain. Lots of people want to use it and it offers great security. But those fees um, mean that you know, maybe you can't do as much as you could if you had a cheaper blockchain. So maybe you want to move to a roll-up or some other side chain that has lower fees. Also, the confirmation time is another aspect. So how long it takes before um, some a transaction in a block is final is different depending on the blockchain. Um, as well, there might be some functionality that is on one blockchain that's not on another blockchain. So you might want to access that functionality. Another thing to think about is liquidity pools. So you might have some liquidity 
um, in, so there might be liquidity for a certain sort of token in one, say, roll-up, and there might be other liquidity in, say, Ethereum mainnet or on some other roll-up. And if there's more liquidity in one spot, often the opportunities um, that avail themselves are greater. So there's also capital utility and efficiency. So maybe you have um, liquidity across multiple chains and you want to, in one single transaction, utilize all of your, you, um, all, all of your money to do something. And so you want to be able to simultaneously access the liquidity across the blockchains. And I've said all that via some notes just here. Um, so if you want to read what I've just said, there it is. So value transfer, how does it actually work? Well, let's walk you through what you want to do. So you've got, say, Ethereum, some Ether on a net, and you want to get to some other blockchain. So you want to send some Ether, send four Ether to that other blockchain. So really, you're going to need to submit a transaction to Ethereum mainnet saying, hey, let's send for Ether to that other blockchain. Um, but the thing to think about is that Ether doesn't exist on that other blockchain. It doesn't know about Ether. So you can't send Ether to the other blockchain because it doesn't exist. So you end up sending what's called wrapped Ether. So in other words, you've got four Ether but represented as an ERC-20 token. And so you say to some contract on mainnet, hey, I want to send four wrapped Ether to the other blockchain. It, it can be represented as wrapped Ether on that other blockchain. And um, so the whole overall process though is a lot more complicated. And let's walk through this process. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to buy that four Ether and say, I want to convert the ether to wrapped ether. So that's the first transaction. And then you need to do what's called a proof. So in an ERC-20 contract, you're the only one who can do a transfer, but there's also a function called transfer from. And so an account can do it and can execute transfer from on so to transfer someone else's money if it has been approved. So Alice here, approves of the bridge contract spending four of her wrapped ether. So using in a transfer from. And so, um, so then she says, all right, submit, let's do this transfer. So she submits a request to the bridge contract saying, can you transfer four wrapped ether to my account on another blockchain? So the reason why she says her account on the other blockchain, rather than just leaving that as something to happen automatically, that she might have a different account on the other blockchain. So she might not have the same private key, um, public key and address on both blockchains. She might also be using a wallet. So if you're using a, a wallet, so a contract, then the in all probability, the contract is not going to be at the same address on both blockchains. And so she needs to be able to specify the recipient address. And as well, she might want to send money from her account on this blockchain to someone else's account on the other blockchain. So then the bridge contract as part of this overall transaction talks to the ERC-20 and does a transfer from, from Alice's account to bridge account of four wrapped ETH. So essentially now the four wrapped ETH belong to the bridge. And then some magic happens. We're going to talk about the magic later on. And then finally, the bridge contract on that other blockchain says, all right, let's transfer four wrapped ETH to Alice's account from the bridge account. So that's one way of doing it, where you're transferring. But another way is that you can mint. So you can create some new value that doesn't exist at the moment. And so the four wrapped ETH goes into Alice's account and it's created. And so that's a minting burning um, idea. So in, that, in this situation, you can view that Alice's um, four ETH on mainnet are currently in escrow or they're locked up and owned by the bridge contract. So you hear people talk about locked up and owned, locked up in the bridge contract, but really 
the tokens are still in that ERC20 contract. It's just the ownership is the bridge contract. And so, yeah, so now we've got, Alice has got her four wrapped ETH on the destination on the other chain. And the bridge contract has four wrapped ETH mainnet. So that transfer has been affected. So there are a lot of other cross-chain use cases. It's not just transferring money. So there's um, something called supply chain financing. And in fact, Sandra Johnson, who's on this call, she's written a great paper on that. There's also um, provenance and selective transparency. So you can imagine you've got a, a blockchain that's all about supply chain and organizing deals and um, when stuff's arrived and um, all sorts of transformational processes. But then you might want to also selectively make transparent key points so that people can use that for traceability to know that, say, some produce is really organic. As well, you can imagine that some countries might decide to stop um, blockchain at their borders. And so they've got, say, inside a country blockchain and outside a country blockchain. Um, the case in points, um, China, for instance, they might decide they've got within China blockchain and the rest of the world blockchain. And so you can imagine to do that cross-border um, supply chain, you're going to need to have a cross-chain transaction. As well, CDBCs. Um, so that should be yeah, CBDC, should I say, um, you can imagine that they're all on different blockchains. And so if you want to have interbank transfers or inter central bank transfers, then you need to be able to have inter CDBCs. Um, and the um, EEA cross chain interoperability working group back about two years ago now, um, or actually we finalized it a year ago, we we're working on it for a year. We um, created a whole stack of um, interoperability use cases. And I encourage you to read that document to get a better idea of how cross-chain can be used. So now I'm gonna talk about terminology and topology. So the blockchain that um, the information is coming from is the source blockchain and the the blockchain that consumes it is invariably called the target or destination blockchain. You can have a unidirectional bridge where you can only transfer information from a source chain to a target chain. Or you can have a bidirectional bridge where information can flow in both directions. So some bridges are custom built just for one pairing of a source chain and a target chain. Other bridges are more generic and can work with a variety of blockchains. Some technologies rely on a hub blockchain. So the source chain has to communicate via the hub chain to communicate with the target chains. And so you have this hub blockchain that helps to um, be an intermediary between all the chains. You can also have um, transactions that go across multiple blockchains and um, they allow you to have more complex use cases. And in this situation, you have a root blockchain and segment blockchains. So one thing that I've been working on and at the EEA we've been discussing and moving towards is a cross-chain protocol stack. And um, we, we think this is important to allow interoperability. And so the idea is that you have cross-chain applications. And so they're applications that work across blockchains. And um, you can imagine you're going to have your application code, but you might also have companies develop software components that are designed to work with the lower protocols and make it easier for application developers to develop great cross-chain applications. You've got cross-chain function calls. And so the, this is the layer that lets you execute some um, complex logic across blockchains. And so you could you know, have a function on a contract with some parameters and it gets called from another blockchain. 
And so the updates associated with these function calls could be atomic, but they could also be not atomic as well. And there are trade-offs um, to be had as far as atomic, not atomic, and things in the middle too. So the cross-chain messaging layer is about ensuring that information can be verified as having come from a certain blockchain. And so it's really the thing that the function call layer is built on. And so you've got a, the messaging layer, which um, you know, provides that information has come from a certain place, function call layer that gives you um, arbitrary execution of um, functions across blockchains, and then the application layer, which builds on those functions. And so having this protocol stack with clearly defined interfaces is really important because it's going to allow interoperability. So you can imagine an application gets to choose which function call implementation it wants to use with which set of messaging implementations and different companies can create their own um, you know, components. It also gives you flexibility. So you, know, you could have a technique could be used, you know, say for a roll up, and um, then maybe you'll have a different technique that you'll use for say from mainnet and you'll be able to have as part of one cross-chain call different um, messaging methodologies and you'll be able to mix and match depending on what makes sense you'll also be able to reuse infrastructure so you can imagine that um, you know you could have a company that offers um, relay nodes from a certain blockchain and has some infrastructure that they've stood up. So you could use that infrastructure to execute your system over. Um, equally, you know you could choose to stand up some infrastructure and then have other people use your infrastructure and you could charge people to use your infrastructure. And so it, rather than you know a lot of people at the moment, whenever they create a bridge, they create the whole protocol stack and they stand up their own infrastructure, um, you know, which is not a good use of resources. Also, having this plug and play um, you know, style, it allows people to work on what they're good at. So maybe you're good at function call capability or messaging capability, or maybe you're just an applications company and you just want something to work. You can focus on what you're good at rather than creating the whole protocol stack. And if you are a researcher, you can do experimentation. You don't have to develop the whole protocol stack from scratch. Um, and so, um, yeah, so you, which is good. So if you're a university researcher, you could take uh, a pre-existing protocol stack that's implemented with these interfaces and create your own component. So I'm going to talk a whole about a whole lot of stuff in the protocol stack, but let's have a bit of a think about um, things first and think, well, these are really questions to think about whilst I'm going through the next um, hundred slides or so. So who is being trusted in the system and how many transactions are needed to facilitate the transfer and who is submitting those um, transactions? So importantly, if I'm a user and I don't have any value on that destination chain, do I have the right or the ability to submit a transaction? And you know, how are these um, infrastructure components compensated? You know, so why should someone offer an infrastructure component if they don't know that they're going to get paid? And um, do the infrastructure components need to interact with users? And if they do, you know, they've got to worry about DDoS attacks and things like that. And how many components need to be compromised or bribed for the system to fail? And what attacks are likely to be possible? And probably the big one is if you had a billion dollars that you wanted to transfer from one blockchain to another blockchain, which of the techniques would you use? So before I dive into the messaging layer, there's an important concept to understand in Ethereum called events. And so you can imagine you have, say, a function called transfer, um, which takes some parameters, and then it can call, um, it can emit an event, so emit deposit uh, with a set of parameters. 
And so this event is defined programmatically. And then that event becomes part of a block. So the event logs include information about which contract emitted an event that is part of a transaction receipt and that is included in a block. So that means that you can confirm that a event was created by a certain um, on a certain blockchain due to a certain transaction. And so you can imagine Alice is there, she submits a transaction and then an event is emitted and the event can be proven to have come from that blockchain. So you can prove that information came from a certain blockchain. Another important thing to understand is finality. So you can imagine you have a blockchain and the canonical chain is shown to the bottom and you've got a fork on at the top. And so forks happen in Ethereum mainnet all the time, and it's due to um, latency across the network. And, you know, you have, say, two miners mine the best block at the same time. So if you've got some stale blocks, they don't, the transactions in them don't necessarily end up in the canonical chain. So the transactions may be also in the canonical chain, but they don't have to be. And so if you're relying on an event, that was emitted by a transaction that never ended up in the canonical chain, then um, you know, you're going to be in trouble. And as well, the transaction when executed on the canonical chain might have ended up creating a different event because the event's got information that is programmable. So it's you know, based on these parameters and those parameters might have changed. So you know, you should, when you're looking at these cross-chain messaging systems, you've got to be sure that the events that you're um, basing everything on belong to transactions that are in blocks that are probably final. And um, so typically on Ethereum mainnet, you want to wait between six and 12 block confirmations. Um, I've written a paper, um, which you can access down the bottom there, which talks through um, how you get the numbers and what they mean. And um, you, know, you can work out which end of that you want to be on. So other blockchains have got faster confirmation times and some of them offer instant finality. And so you know, if you've got one second blocks instant finality, then you're ready to go after one second. However, you do need to be watching out for um, centralization and security issues. So as the block time gets less and um, you know, as things um, become quicker, you know, there's, there are trade-offs. And so you've always got to be mindful of that. So I'm going to talk about EVM-based blockchains, um, but, you know, and that, that covers a lot. So, you know, you've got all of those purely EVM-based um, blockchains and sidechains. And um, you've also got roll-ups. So all the optimistic roll-ups are EVM compatible. All of the ZK roll-ups um, seem to be moving towards EVM compatibility too. Um, but, you know, EVM is not the only um, show in town. Um, there are a lot of other uh, blockchains out there. So I'm going to assume that all of you can produce apps or messages in some way, shape or form. And I think that is generally true. Bitcoin obviously can't, but um, I think pretty much all of the other platforms can. So one of the big design choices that you've got to make in, any, in, in these systems is trust. And... Um, you know, so people talk about trustless. Um, and I think trustless is a bit of a misnomer because, um, you know, at the end of the day, you're always trusting someone. And it's just really a matter of knowing who you're trusting and how many people you're trusting. And, um, you know, that, that's really what it comes down to. So on Ethereum mainnet, for instance, if 51% of the proof of work miners became dishonest, which is not going to happen. But if it did, you know, then you'd be in trouble. So it's a matter of knowing who you are trusting. And so um, trustless, the hope is that you don't have to trust anyone, but that's not quite true ever. Semi-trusted or almost trustless, it's, you know, you've got to trust that at least one party is honest. And then you've got semi-trusted, where maybe you're aiming for a threshold number of honest players. 
and trusted, well, you're relying on one single party and you're hoping that they're honest. So trustless. So it generally comes down to hash time lock contracts. And so the idea is that you are going to release um, some value based on a pre-image being presented based on a hash. So H equals the message digest of R, where R is a random number. So R is the pre-image. And so you, um, you know, so HTLCs aren't, by the way, um, exactly messaging protocols, but they're pretty similar. And so, um, so when you're looking at a HTLC, the first thing you need to do is set who deals between and how much is being transacted. And that may happen off chain, could happen on chain. And then the next step is that Alice comes along and she puts in some um, value, say, um, 10, and she says, all right, 10 beta um, coins on blockchain B, Jimming, I get um, one alpha on blockchain A. And so she puts in her 10 beta and she sets up a timeout. And then Bob then deposits his tokens on blockchain A. And then Alice submits R such that H equals uh, message digest of R. So in other words, assuming that equation works, then she can withdraw her tokens on blockchain A. And then Bob then comes in and sees that R value and submits it on blockchain B. And then he can withdraw his tokens. And so that sounds great. No one had to trust anyone, but um, and it, it is atomic, usually. Um, so it's limited to value transfers. There's also griefing attacks possible. So griefing attack is other, always also known as sore loser attacks. And so Bob could just choose to not do step three. So Bob could not put his coins in and Alice has to wait around for until the timeout. And um, also, Alice could um, wait for um, wait for Bob to submit, um, you know, to submit the R, and then um, you know, uh, yes, you can get the slides. And so, um, and the coin the coins will be locked up forevermore. So it requires the parties to be observing the blockchain, which is a bit of an issue, and as well. In the time you have to be careful with the timeouts. You want to have more timeout on blockchain A than blockchain B. Otherwise, Alice will have to wait um, until you know could wait just before the timeout and then do her withdrawal, not giving Bob enough time. And um, also, if Alice can make Bob um, go offline by maybe turning the electricity off where he lives, or um, um, maybe making the blockchain that um, Bob's trying to submit his R value to busy, then again, he could um, end up not being able to execute before the timeout and losing his money. So that's the basic HTLC mechanism, but what about as a bridge? And so um, you need to have two transactions on both blockchains, which is, um, you know, that's some block, some transactions. And Alice needs to be able to submit transactions on the source blockchain. And Bob needs to be able to tra submit transactions on the destination blockchain. But how do they do that if they don't have any value on those chains? Um, another issue that some is sometimes cited is using HTLCs with consortium chains, such as IBFT. And the thought is that blockchain validators could be bribed or just refuse to submit transactions until the timeout. And so you can imagine that, you know, you could have um, you know, dishonest validators doing that. But if you've got just one honest validator in an IBFT network, they will be able to submit the transaction for you. And um, so if, but if all of the validators on that destination blockchain or source blockchain get bribed, then you're in really big trouble anyway, because your whole security of your blockchain is blown. Um, so, um, yeah, there's also talk of using deposits to stop the griefing attacks. The issue, of course, with them is that they introduce more latency and you're doing more transactions. So Connext have come up with a modified HTLC-based um, bridge 
And their idea is that they don't want Bob to have to have gas on the destination chain. And their, their modification, though, is that um, for that step where Bob would have put in R to get the value, a relayer does it on his behalf. And in fact, you're interacting with a relayer for the whole um, for the whole situation. So rather than it being Alice and Bob, it's relayer and Bob. So in that case, though, Bob has to trust this relayer, this router. And if the router cheats, then um, he's suddenly got to get value onto the chain so he can get his money. So you know, if the whole reason for Bob doing the transfer was to get value on the um, target chain, then um, you know he's in trouble. So. Um, uh, yeah, this is a, um, a bit of a centralization and fully trusting part of their trustless um, scenario. So, yeah. So there's also semi-trusted or almost trustless mechanisms too. And so um, one of them is essentially BTC relay. So essentially, uh, um, from if you've read the Bitcoin white paper, there was this concept of a simple payment verification and essentially you run a light client of the consensus protocol on the destination blockchain. And so you use um, the proof of work hashing power, for instance, of the source blockchain to be sure that the information can be trusted. And so the first step, of course, is to deploy to the destination blockchain a contract that's got, say, the genesis block or some other starting block that um, can be used to confirm new blocks. And so um, how it works is that you have Alice, who's a relayer, and hopefully there are lots of relays, and they grab um, block headers off the blockchain A, so the blockchain, and they put them on the destination blockchain. And those block headers are only trusted or accepted if the, um, the rules for the um, consensus protocol, so proof of work, um, are correct. So the difficulty is okay and it's building off the last block header. And so, um, yep, so I've just said that. And so then Bob then executes a transaction on the source chain, which um, causes um, that block, that transaction to be included in a block. So for Bitcoin, there aren't any events. And so BTC Relay is all about Bitcoin and Ethereum. So um, yeah, but so his transaction gets included in a Merkle tree of transactions. And then um, the block header um, that contained his transaction gets transferred across. And then once enough other block headers have been built on top of that block header, and you have, say, six block confirmations, then you're ready to go to use that transaction. And then um, Bob then can submit his transaction on the destination chain with the, the transaction from the source chain and a Merkle proof showing that it was included in the block and then doing something with that. And so the compensation model that we've got here is that users pay for confirmed transactions and then the relayers that have um, block headers that are used get compensated. And so the advantages of all this is that you only need one honest relayer. So you can have as many dishonest relayers as you like submitting false block headers that are on forks of the canonical chain, but you just need one real um, honest um, relayer who submits the canonical chain and it's going to have better proof of work. So better, um, better weight, better um, you know, length. And so hence that will be the trusted chain. There is a disadvantage or actually multiple and one of the big ones is that if there are no transactions on that um, BTC relay, then the relayers aren't being compensated and so they'll stop working. And so if there are no confirmed transaction block headers, then you can't confirm transactions. And um, so, you know, the, another this sort of approach is being tried on other blockchains that don't have as good proof of work um, capability. And the problem is that then um, the whole system can be hacked because someone can um, come up with a um, better block than the real blockchain by, um, you know, just doing better proof of work. And another issue is that the proof of work algorithm has to be able to be implemented on the target blockchain. 
So there are some attacks as well. So um, Lise et al. came up with this great attack. So imagine Eve has a thousand dollars on Ethereum mainnet. And so Eve sets up the contract so that it, she says, if someone gives me a thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin on Bitcoin, then I'll give them a thousand dollars on Ethereum. And then Eve convinces Alice and Bob to transfer a thousand dollars of Bitcoin to her on Bitcoin based on the ETH that's on mainnet. So only um, Alice or Bob, though, will be able to confirm their transaction um, because you know one of them will get the thousand dollars worth of ETH, and the other, by the time they submit, it'll be too late. There won't be any ETH there, and so Alice gets two thousand dollars of BTC. Um, or rather Eve gets 2,000 of BTC and Alice gets 1,000 and Bob gets nothing. They also identified another attack, a liveness one. And so you could imagine that Eve convinces Alice to have $1,000 of ETH on mainnet. And um, then Eve walks away and never transfers any money. So Alice now has got her money locked up forever, which is not good. Um, as well, Martin Swend, who um, was the chief security person at Ethereum Foundation, he identified a software defect as well, which meant that you could um, you could get around having to pay to um, have blocks or transactions confirmed. So there were software bugs as well. So that was BTC Relay. Has anyone tried a similar thing with Ethereum mainnet? And the answer is yes. So there's Rainbow's, uh, the Rainbow Bridge by Near Protocol. And so it's a way of going from mainnet to Near's um, blockchain. And so they've done this massive feat of getting the Ethereum proof of work algorithm to work on Near. And um, you know, it's, it's a huge feat because it's a time and memory hard protocol. And so it's much co more complicated than Bitcoin's protocol. And um, so it works, um, but, 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 but Ethereum mainnet is going to be um, coming proof of stake in Q1 next year, probably. And so once the merge happens, this bridge is not going to work because there'll be no proof of work anymore. So um, now I'm going to talk about these semi-trusted or trusted mechanisms. And Invariably, you've got a threshold number of relayers or some validators or testers, and they sign, or maybe they do multi-party computation on, on the source chain. So threshold signing, essentially, but sometimes it's not threshold signing, it's computation. And if you've got a trusted system, maybe you've only got one relayer. And so the public keys of the system are registered on the target blockchain, which invariably means for Ethereum, the address is stored on the blockchain. So I'm going to walk through a, a whole stack of approaches. Um, but you know, the choices really come down to who is signing? Is it just do you sign individual messages or maybe a Merkle route, whether you've got a whole Merkle tree of messages? Um, you know, do you create that Merkle tree yourself or are you relying on block headers and transactions? So have the blockchain create that Merkle tree? Um, do the testers cooperatively sign or do they separately sign? And do the um, and, and relays and testers respond to requests from users and maybe have to deal with um, DOS attacks? And so who does put that transaction on the destination blockchain? So the first approach um, is a bit like iron framework. So you have a source blockchain and you have Alice submitting a transaction and it emits an event. So business logic contract calls the bridge contract and the bridge contract emits an event. And then um, you can imagine that you have relayers and they see the event, they see um, blocks being produced. And once the blocks are final, they each individually submit the block header on the destination blockchain. And then Alice then can submit her event with a Merkle proof, which says this event was part of that block and hence you should trust it. And then some, then based on the function call that's submitted, a business logic contract gets called. And so for the, 
the simplest approach, you're submitting all of the block headers. And so this is simple. Um, and you know, the relays don't have to talk to each other and the users aren't interacting with the relays, which is good. But um, you're submitting one transaction for each relayer for each block, which is a lot of transactions. And um, you know, if there are multiple target blockchains, then these um, these transactions are going in all sorts of directions. You've got transactions for each block, so it's a lot of um, stuff happening. Um, and you know, the relayers have to pay to submit those transactions. It's going to cost money. Um, and um, you know, the user also they have to be able to submit a transaction on the destination, which is not good. So you can, a subtle modification of the system is the relayers watching the events and watching the, the, um, the block headers and only submitting the block headers that are needed onto the destination. And in this case, you know, the, you're only doing one transaction per relayer per block um, that is needed. But of course, the big thing is that now you've got to work out which transactions are going to which blockchain and hence which block headers need to be transferred. So suddenly your relayers have to get more complicated. They need to be able to understand which block headers to transfer. And um, another slight change would be that the relayers cooperate and then just one of them transfers the needed block header. And so this is good because now you've gone down from, um, you know, one transaction per block per relayer to just one transaction per block header that's needed. But the relays do need to talk to each other. And, you know, that cooperation, that protocol that um, of all that communication is non-trivial. Another mechanism that doesn't use these relays is having an attester. And so again, Alice submits a transaction, Bridge emits an event, and then the user says to a set of attesters, hey, can, did you see that event? Can you give me, can you sign that event and say it came from this source blockchain and it should be trusted? And then she gets a threshold number of those signed events, and then she submits them to the bridge contract and again executes her code. So the attesters don't have to submit any transactions on the destination blockchain, which is fantastic. Um, um, but the attesters um, have to are only signing for a certain contract, so they don't need to understand the target blockchain either, and they don't need to cooperate. Uh, but the users have to interact with all of those attesters, which is um, pretty big. The attesters could cooperate, and then the user just has to interact with one of the attesters. Um, but now um, the attesters are going to have to cooperate, and that's you know pretty big. Um, and the user is still interacting with the attester, which is not good. Another way you could do it is the relayers, rather than relaying block headers, they could relay the event themselves. And so they could look at the event and then they could all separately relay the event. And this is how ChainSafe's chain bridge works. And so the relayers aren't cooperating, which is great. Um, and the user isn't interacting with the relayers, which is great as well. And the users don't need to submit a transaction on the destination, which is fantastic. You know, they don't need any value. However, the relayers are submitting one transaction per event and they're submitting transactions on the destination blockchain. So suddenly you've got to worry about how much is it costing for the relayers to submit transactions on the destination. And um, yeah, the um, relayers do need to have some understanding of the target blockchain um, of, you know, for that event. So um, yeah, it, it, it adds some levels of complexity as well. So the relays could um, cooperate with each other and then submit a signed event, which would be another approach, um, which means that now we're only got one transaction per event from the relays, but the relays need to cooperate. Another approach is um, one that um, the Solana bridge has, has done. 
So the Solana to Ethereum, their, their bridge is called Wormhole. And so with their approach, you have a, you, you know, you do that um, set of, um, you know, emit the event on the source. You have a set of attesters and um, what you do is you observe um, the event and then what you do is you submit that event as a signed event on a special cross-chain event contract. And then anyone can fetch that signed event. And then they can then submit that event on a destination blockchain. And so the good thing about this approach is that the relayers aren't submitting any transactions on the destination blockchain. And so, you know, they don't need to, um, you know, be doing any, any interaction, which is really good. Um, but they do need to cooperate and the user is submitting that transaction on the destination. Um, another interesting approach is the Cello Optics um, bridge. And so with their one, I mean, it's far more complicated than I'm going to talk about, but I'm going to give you some um, a feel for it though. So the user submits a transaction that emits an event, and then you have these attesters put the event, um, the, the message into a queue of messages and create an incremental Merkle tree. And so I think you can think of um, how Ethereum 2's beacon chain has an incremental Merkle tree model. They're, I think they're using the same thing. And so um, what's happening is they um, submit back to the source chain the root of that incremental Merkle tree. And so what, for each message coming out, they're giving a new root. And so you can look at, say, root two. So in root one, you've got message one and message two could be confirmed based on root one. But then when you added message three, you've got root two. And the good thing about root two is, though, you can still confirm message one and two as well as message three. So, you know, in block header transfer, each block header is different. And so you're not summing up all of your messages into one tree, whereas in this approach you are. So it, it has, that, that's a really good feature. And so they, the attesters um, submit an ordered list of um, Merkle routes back to a contract. Then you have relayers. Um, and they grab those Merkle roots. And so they might grab, say, one a second, one a minute, one an hour, one every hundredth um, Merkle root. You know, it's really up to the relayer as to how often they um, do this transfer. And the relayer submits the signed Merkle root to a bridge contract. And so then after a wait period, the, um, the bridge users can then use that um, Merkle route to submit their message, which then calls a business logic contract. So, um, yeah, use, that use of the Merkle trees is an interesting one. So the, in Cello Optics, you only need to have one relayer um, transferring the Merkle route. So this saves gas. Um, but you do need to wait for this broad window to expire. And then um, the idea is you're going to have some observers who are going to submit malicious um, Merkle routes back to the source chain um, so that, you know, you know about that, um, you know, that, so you can slash a tester, so the updaters. Um, another sort of deficiency or issue with the protocol overall is that it's up to the application to block malicious messages. So if you're on that destination chain, as an application, you need to understand whether a message is malicious and then block its usage. And so this is sort of the application layer, sort of knowing stuff about the messaging layer, which seems to be a bit of a, a mix up of um, protocol layers to me. Um, and so, yeah, so the relays um, aren't submitting any any um, transactions on the destination chain? Well, they sort of are. The attesters aren't, but the relayers are. Um, and um, they, um, you know, so the relayers again, they're not having to worry about the actual target blockchain. Well, the attesters don't, but the relayers do. And the users aren't interacting with the attesters or the relayers, which is good. 
Um, but, you know, the attesters are cooperating, the relays don't need to. So I think my, my words here need to be reworked. Sorry about that. Next edition. So I've talked about a, a whole stack of different schemes for transferring events. And one thing I've skirted around is actually the signing process. So, you know, you obviously you've got ECDSA, but you've also got BLS and BLS comes in multiple forms. So you can have aggregated BLS and have th um, threshold BLS based on that. So where you add all your BLS signatures and you keep track of which one signed, and then you use that to work out um, the which public key to use. Or you can have threshold signatures where you have one public key and you use essentially multi-party computation to work together to cooperate to create a um, signature. Um, you can also use Schnorr aggregated signatures. That's what one chain is using. So I've talked just point to point, but as well, you know, as I said, we can you can have hub blockchains as well. Um, so the reason why people like hub blockchains is rather than having to have potentially, you know, n to order n number of um, bridges, you might only have, you know, like um, an order one number of bridges. So. In, in order of, you know, like the number of blockchains is the number of bridges rather than it being a multiple. So, you know, they reduce the number of bridges you've got to have, which is good, but um, do all the blockchains and rollups need to be interconnected? Good, you know, something to think through. And these hub blockchains are not going to, you know, they're, they're not charities, they're not going to do stuff for free. Um, and as well, the latency is going to increase going across these hubs. So, you know, you're going to increase the latency of your transaction. Poly Network um, has a hub blockchain as well. And in their approach, they have a Merkle tree of Merkle trees. And so the idea there is that, you know, you've got your Merkle root from one blockchain and a Merkle root from another blockchain, and then you aggregate those Merkle roots up and you then advertise the Merkle route the, you know, of the whole network to all the blockchains. So there's also staking and slashing. And so the attesters or relayers, they can be required to front up some money. So I've heard um, amounts such as 50,000 and 100,000 dollars mentioned. And so, you know, you stake that money and then if you're proven or your uh, threshold number of you're proven to do the wrong thing, you get slashed. So, you know, something to think about is how much money is being staked. So, you know, if you're transferring $500,000 and there are 25 um, relayers and it's 17 of 25 and they're each staking $100,000 and it's $1.7 million is being staked. So 500K is probably okay. But, you know, if they were only staking 20 bucks, then it's a bit of a problem. Um, and so, you know, you need to also understand when people say we've got this staking slashing solution, you all sh always should ask, how am I going to go about slashing? You know, it's great to say I could slash, but, you know, how do I really go about slashing? Who can do the slashing and how is it really done? And who can be slashed? So, you know, you might find that there are only very few parties in the overall solution that can be slashed and only in very certain situations. And so the slashing staking solution might not be as good as it sounds. Um, yeah, and how is, how is misbehavior proven? And invariably, this is gonna to have to come down to some sort of cryptographic enforcement. It can't be he said, she said. It's got to be, look, you know, they signed this, but this is obviously malicious and I can prove that they signed something that's wrong. Another thing to think about is transactions. So what happens in the system if a transaction fails? You know, does the, does the relayer retry the transaction? Does it reprice the transaction? You know, same nonce, higher tip or higher gas price. You know, what happens? How does this work? And, uh, you know, this is something that's quite key. And you could imagine that, you know, this does happen, that, you know, maybe the permissioning might fail or something like that. So what about at the function call layer? 
So you can imagine that you have a um, single blockchain call where you have, um, say, this swap function calling trans. So you've got con D trans down the bottom there. And so you've noticed that you've flipped your from and to because you're um, on one on one contract, you're um, transferring from to to, and on the other one, you're getting to to from. And um, Abhe, it'll be on YouTube. Um, yeah. And so if you're in the cross cross call um, situation, then in the multi blockchain, you need some magic um, function, some cross call function to do this transfer for you, where you're specifying the destination blockchain and contract the um, function to call and the parameters. And so you could have a simple function call protocol. And um, so you call a contract on a blockchain based on an event. And in fact, I've implemented an example version of this. And so in this not atomic um, version of um, the system, you know, you you have a business logic contract, submits a transaction, goes to the function call layer. And then using one of those messaging protocols, you go across to the function call layer on the other blockchain. And then that bridge contract executes the function for you. And so, you know, nice and simple. However, it's not atomic. So these updates across blockchains are not atomic. And so the transaction on that destination chain could fail. And the reasons why it could fail is maybe there's a revert that happens, you know? So maybe the, um, the, on the destination chain, there's not enough funds or there's some other um, situation that you get a revert. Um, you might not have enough ether to pay for gas, um, say for the relayer. Um, you might not have permissioning. So maybe it's um, their solidity level permissioning that's blocking the call, but maybe also um, there are some other level of permissioning. So maybe it's a private network and you no longer have permissioning to submit a transaction. Um, and maybe you submitted a transaction at a certain gas price, but now suddenly there's an NFT sale and the gas prices have gone up by a factor of 10. Or maybe just something, there's a configuration issue and the nonce is incorrect, you know. So it does happen all the time that transactions fail, including on bridges. And so you've got to realise that if you've got a non-atomic protocol, you've got to deal with them. You've got the, another protocol that I've um, worked on is GPACT. And so it's general purpose atomic cross-chain transaction protocol. And so it's all about atomic updates across blockchains. And so either all of the updates are committed or they're all discarded. So you can think of it as a two-phase commit scheme for call execution trees. And it allows you to have a composable synchronous execution model that is what application developers are accustomed to. So in Solidity on Ethereum mainnet, it's composable, so you can have components that you can bring together to create an overall application. When you execute something, it executes immediately. So, uh, and when you have a return result, it's there when you, you know, uh, and when the function returns. And so it's synchronous as well as composable. And so this protocol gives you that as well. And so there's an open source repo with the um, implementation of this protocol. And so this protocol allows you to do complex things like this, where you have a root transaction, say a trade wallet that talks to a blockchain, which has say some business terms in it, saying that a shipment has occurred, let's pay on the finance blockchain and let's have the logistics transfer ownership on the logistics blockchain. <coughs> Excuse me. And so you can do that cross um, system, cross blockchain um, call using this protocol. And so the idea is that you have the entry point function calls on each of the blockchains and you have the parameter values that you're going to pass in and you commit to those values. And then you advertise that commitment by having a start transaction. 
And then you have the segment transactions, which make, make up the leaves of the call execution tree. And you work from the leaves up to the root of the execution tree. And then when you finally execute the root of the execution tree, then you're saying commit or discard. And so you're saying, should all the updates across the blockchains be committed or discarded? And then you commit or discard them using a signaling transaction. And so the technology uses lockable storage. And so the business logic contracts, they have to all values that are going to change part of a cross-chain call in lockable storage. And so you have a cross-chain control contract that controls the overall execution on that blockchain. And it works with a verifier to verify those cross-chain messaging um, information from other blockchains. And you call out to lockable storage, and then you call back in to do a cross-chain call. And so there's a technical paper which explains this in great detail. And there's also some videos um, on the YouTube channel for the Ethereum Engineering Group Meetup. And so, yeah, please watch them to understand the protocol in more detail. So the thing to think about when you're using um, this protocol, and I dare say most of the atomic ones, is that you cannot have unpredictable values that are going to be part of a parameter. And so you can't say have the block hash of the current block or the block, um, the timestamp. Um, and so the storage locations that are going to affect the parameter values need to be accessible because you're going to need to be able to work out what they are so you can commit to them. Um, the applications need to be designed with locking in mind. So you can't um, just execute um, and not do any locking. But as well, if you've got something, a resource that many people are going to execute, you need to design for parallel execution with locking. And it can be done. So the root blockchain needs to be accessible as well, because it's the thing that you're going to be saying, should I commit or re, um, discard? And so you need to be able to access that blockchain as an application. Um, the gas costs are more than the non-atomic protocol. So it's around three times is my current um, thinking, though um, the gas prices or the gas usage is being optimised. So anything in blockchain is subject to front running attacks, but let's face it, if you're advertising in a cross-chain protocol, this is what I'm planning to do then you know, you've even got more front running attacks possible. So you need to design with front running attacks in mind. And um, I, again, in my um, talk on GPACT, I talk about how to get around front running attacks. So comparing GPACT atomic with a non-atomic, so a simple function call protocol, atomic across chains, um, and if any of the parts of the transaction fail, you're all good. Whereas in for non-atomic, you've really got to worry about failures. It's higher gas cost. So compared, if you had all your um, say ERC20 transfers on one um, blockchain, then compared to that, it's about 10 times as expensive. Um, if it's a non-atomic, it's about three or four times as expensive. So you know, that, that's the overall approximation. Um, so the non-atomic will work on any contract, whereas at GPAC, you've got to have locking in mind. Um, but non-atomic, you, you don't have a standard execution model and, um, you know, you can't return values and, um, you know, you've got to be um, worried about each segment executing separately. Whereas with um, GPAC, it's all together, it's just like you're executing on a normal blockchain, but you've got your logic spread across blockchains. Um, yeah, and so um, I encourage you to compare, you know, if you've ever got an application, implement it as a single blockchain solution and then implement it as, say, a GPAC and a non atomic to try and understand what the um, you know, trade offs are and how, you know, what the actual higher gas costs may be, because it's going to be application specific. So um, so one thing to, um, and, you know, so when we're looking at design considerations for the blockchain layer, um, you know, the th thing you've got to think about is that, um, <coughs> that, you know, you've got to be trusting that event emitter. And so you need to know, so that function call layer bridge 
on the destination, it needs to only trust events submitted by the function call layer bridge on the source blockchain. And so you can't just trust any, any um, contract. You've got to just trust that contract. And, um, you know, so for the relayers, um, you know, you, you need to be, of when you've got these messages going along, you need to worry about replay. And, you know, you wouldn't want an odd message that said transfer 10 tokens to someone to be replayed again and again. So you have to have a way of having some sort of unique ID or something to prevent replay um, attacks. Um, and as well, you might want to just have a timeout or age events. So say, look, after one hour, any event from that from any blockchain is deemed invalid. And that's just to stop people storing up old events that somehow or other they've got obtained, or maybe they've found some compromised private key or something, and then they've created a malicious event. So I think you've got to look at having timeouts. And the timeouts can also work in with those unique IDs that I talked about just before, so that then you don't need to store all of your new unique IDs for all time, and you can delete old ones. Another thing to think about when you're designing these systems is ap application level access control. So, you know, in um, on normal, you know, Solidity on um, one blockchain, you have message sender equals owner or authorized, and um, then um, you know, throw a require if you um, are not authorized. So, in a cross chain situation, it's going to have to look something like this. So. Does, you know, is that source blockchain in the list of or in the map of authorized blockchains? And is the source address authorized as well? And um, was the actual, the person, you know, the entity that sent me this or did this function call, was it the actual function call bridge contract or something else? Um, so, you know, so it's worthwhile. You've got to do this application authentication to make sure you're being called by a valid party. Because you know that business logic contract there needs to know it's the bridge calling it and not some other contract. So, yeah. So the the function call layer has to provide the blockchain source blockchain ID and source contract address for applications. And so that's something that you've got to design into your function call protocol, on and should be there. And for these multi-blockchain protocols like GPACT, you need to know about the root blockchain as well and have its identifier as part of the overall call. So you can have a bridge that allows you to do arbitrary execution where you can execute anything, or you could decide to restrict which functions can be called. So you could um, have a allow list of, you can call these contracts and these functions. And obviously arbitrary execution is going to be simpler, but it could give you some more security risks. So, um, you know, you, you've got to think about the flexibility and simplicity versus security um, and what does your solution need? It's also a good idea to be able to pause a bridge. And so, you know, all the, you need to be able to essentially pull the plug temporarily and say, hey, something bad is happening. Let's pause the whole bridge. It'll be a pain to customers, but if you're currently being hacked, um, it's probably a good thing to be able to do. So we've done the messaging layer and the, and the function call layer. Now let's hit the application layer. So we now need to have the move up the stack a bit. And so now we're in our business logic contract. And really, your business logic contract is going to need to know that it's really dealing with um, part of your application and not some random other contract. So maybe you need an allow list of application contracts that can talk to you. So sure, in some situations, you're going to be open to any um, any any application, any contract on any blockchain, but in other situations, it's going to be more linked. And so you need to have that allow list. You need to be pausable as well. Um, so 
And the reason for having plausibility at the function call layer and the application layer is what happens if there are multiple applications using the one function call bridge and it's only your application that's being hacked? The function call bridge is not going to want to pause. They're going to want to keep on going. And so you, um, yeah, so you might be in your best interest to um, have your own pause feature. And it's not going to cost you a lot of gas because all you're going to do is be reading one storage location to say, am I paused? So it's not a biggie. Um, and um, so another thing to think through at the application layer is that if you are using a non-atomic cross-chain function call layer, then you, know, you could have failed transactions. And so invariably you'll see these ERC20 um, bridge um, contracts and they'll have some admin transfer. So it's where this, you've got this um, <coughs> entity that can um, do a transfer to anyone for any token in any amount. So, you know, imagine if you had, say, um, $200 million worth of wrapped ETH on your bridge, and you've got some admin somewhere can just do this call and can transfer all that money. So it's a, it's a bit of a scary thing. And so I guess the question is, who is this really trusted admin that you're going to have? And what happens if they send $200 million to the wrong address? Or even if it's just a, a $10,000 transfer that fails and they have to do a refund, what happens if they send, you know, they do a typo and they send $100,000 rather than $10,000? Or they send it to the wrong recipient or for the wrong token? It, to me, it feels like a complete nightmare. Um, yeah. So I think the idea of, I mean, this is the real cost of non-atomic bridges is having to have this admin transfer. So as well in the, at the GPACT um, protocol, so we allows, it requires locking and the locking is actually done in the application. And so you can do locking for a whole contract at a time or just single storage locations and so if you do for a whole contract obviously your whole contract is locked but it's simpler and it's going to cost less gas but um, if you're doing per storage location then you can have far more complex designs and in fact there's templates to help you you know to make this simple for you um, but it does cost a bit more gas another thing to think through especially for erc20 is minting and burning and mass conservation. So these, um, the, you can have a, an ERC20 bridge or ERC20 contract, should I say, which is a minter burner. And in this situation, any user can burn tokens. So essentially throw them away, have them destroyed. You can have burn from where um, another account being, can be authorized or allowed to burn your tokens. As well, um, certain entities with a minter role can be authorized to mint tokens. So you can imagine that you've got, say, Ethereum mainnet and a sidechain. And when someone transfers tokens from mainnet to the sidechain, you want to mint some tokens to give them based on what they've done on mainnet. And um, the so the, the, what that's going to mean is that the, the entity that's authorized to mint is going to be the cross-chain bridge. And so, you know, that's a bit of a problem because it means that this bridge contract, which could be hacked, is has the ability to mint as many tokens as it likes. So the opposite type of um, bridge or contract is a mass conservation contract. And in one of those, you, um, you, you work out your total supply and at that point, you can't go off and um, create more tokens. And so invariably, you, um, your, your bridge owns some tokens and it transfers um, essentially to users and then they transfer tokens to the bridge, um, to the bridge ownership. And so in that way, the bridge is holding the tokens in escrow. So if they're bugged, 
most tokens that can be stolen is the number of tokens that were in escrow. And so the attacker can't create more tokens. And of course, you can limit how many tokens are active as well. The bridge doesn't have to own all the tokens. So another thought is limiting the value on the bridge. So if you've got say $50,000 per staker and you've got overall a million dollars staked, say, um, then you, know, you could say, all right, we want to limit what's on the bridge to being less than um, the amount being staked. Um, but of course, as we know, it's not the amount staked, it's the amount that can be slashed, which is you know, subtly different. Um, but yeah, so you want to try and limit that. But the question then that you've got to ask yourself about, all right, we're going to limit, we're going to have a bridge quota is, so at which layer of the bridge are we doing this quota? And, you know, say, can the, say, function call layer know anything about the amount of money on the bridge? And um, what about ERC20 or ERC721 tokens? So the NFTs, how much is an NFT worth? So how do you work out how much you've got on the bridge? And what about a trade finance situation? You know, how does that relate to money on the bridge? And um, for that matter, how do you temporarily reject things or pause, pause transactions whilst you're waiting for money to go off the bridge? And what is on the bridge anyway? What does it mean to be on the bridge? So um, another th um, thought is at the application layer is that all these cross-chain transactions cost money. So maybe you could somehow or other batch them up and you know, say maybe hold all transactions for say 10 minutes and then send them off in a single transaction. Or maybe you allow users to send multiple different tokens all in one transfer. So you're gonna to have to worry about then what happens if one but not all fail on the destination? What happens then? So I think there's a lot of complexity trade-offs there. All right, security. So there is, um, so Open Zeppelin is a project which does um, lots of template contracts for, um, that you can use. And they've got um, some access control contracts and you know, using them to then have different access levels for different users is a great idea. So you, know, you wouldn't want to have say process data and add new bridge contract being part of, you know, having the same access level. You need to have different um, roles and different access levels so that you've got some level of security. So you want to separate out the data chain or the data channel and the control channel so that you can't get that mix wrong. Another really big thing with security is, you know, before you take on some source of destination blockchain or roll up, you've got to look at the security of it. Do you trust that they've got good security? You know, I'm talking about physical security. I'm talking about e-security. Are there, could their private keys get compromised? And, you know, how, how solid is that blockchain? Because as, you know, the diagram here, if that ground gave way, that whole bridge is going. And it's, you know, what happens if the bridge um, stops working because a source blockchain becomes untrusted because it becomes fully compromised? What happens to the tokens that came from that bridge that are on another blockchain? How does that all work? Another security thing to think through is attack surface. So when you've got a single blockchain application, your attack surface is that blockchain. But you know, once you're looking at cross-chain, your attack surface has now extended to the other interconnected blockchains. And so you, know, you really need to then be controlling which blockchain you react to. Okay, another thing to think through is the blockchain IDs. So where do they come from? Are they correct? How do you know that you're interacting with the right blockchain? And um, you know, where did, where, where, how do you work out the boot nodes to interact with? So we, Wager and I, um, via the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, have come up with a, um, a, an EIP, 
that talks about this. So have a look at that. Upgrade is another thing. So um, you know you need you may need to fix defects in your contracts, um, and so you need to have upgradable contract pattern. And so there's two ways of doing this. One is um, like having a separate data holder and business logic contract. There's also another upgradable pattern um, that um, Open Zeppelin have come up with, which is really cool. And so you really need, need to think about um, having that ability, but also you've got to think about the ramifications of being able to upgrade. So will users be concerned about contracts that are upgraded? And um, another really big thing for security, and this is for users, but you know, who are these POA people, these um, attesters and relayers? Should they be trusted? And you know, do they use staking and slashing? And how do you go about slashing someone? And um, how are they allocated? Is it some sort of random allocation? Um, a bit like say how Ethereum 2 is gonna work? Um, yeah, how does it work? And so, if the if the the validators say were um, the same or rather the relayers were the same as the validators from the side chain that you're interacting with, then maybe that's pretty good because they've got a vested interest in making sure that the blockchain doesn't get hacked. And a lot of these protocols have these watchers or fishermen, fisherwomen who are going to be watching the chain to make sure everything's good, but. Who pays for them to keep on working? And if there's 99% of the time there's no bad behavior, then they're not being paid. So they're not going to operate. So who's paying the watchers to watch the network? So we've also at the EEA come up with some great security guidelines. I encourage you to have a look at them. So people ask this um, quite regularly, um, at, you know, how many TPS, and it really does depend. And so the limitations are gonna be caused at multiple levels. And so one is that um, if the relayers have to sign every message, that's gonna be a limiter because a lot of signing and you've got to be submitting those transactions to the destination blockchain. But equally, if you've got to coordinate, that's a lot of work too. And you know, the number of transactions that need to be submitted on the chains is another thing. And the amount of gas used is, you know, because that affects the amount of um, transactions that can be submitted. There's also, if you're going to have mass, um, have a quota on the bridge, then what's the latency across the bridge? And what about if you've got a hub blockchain? Well, what's its maximum TPS? And is that going to be the limiter? Um, you've got to worry about also the performance of these blockchains. And especially when they're in congestion, maybe um, the scalability of your bridge is going to go down. And um, as well, the, at the application level, it's going to come down to what's being executed and as well, how the, um, if for lockable contracts, how they've been designed and whether you can have parallelism or not, or it's all got to be um, serially done. Bridge fees, how are we going to make money out of all of this? So um, bridge fees can be charged at many levels. And um, in fact, I, I should have probably put in the messaging layer as well. So, you know, I think the messaging layer could be watching who's doing what and refuse to um, transfer or relay uh, messages if um, you haven't subscribed, for instance. But you could imagine you could um, have some ERC20 that you, that you, um, that you ask for. Um, that, you know, so you could have, imagine you can have an ERC20 that you get charged as part of the bridge function call. And um, you could also require ETH be um, transferred as part of the call. You could have people being in an allow list and you pay um, based on um, a subscription service. And so, yeah, so th there are many mechanisms. Okay, so the EEA working group is working on standardizing the um, interfaces between layers. And in the GPAC repo, you will find this protocol stack, including the interfaces. And so, um, yep, this is being actively worked on. Um, I encourage you to have a play with it, have a go, feel free to contribute. 
So some philosophical questions before the end. And um, yeah, so Abhe, if you do a, if you Google Ethereum Engineering Group on YouTube, you will find our YouTube channel. Okay, so philosophical questions. Um, the, um, so what is a bridge? So, you know, is it the function call layer, the messaging layer or the application layer or somewhere in the middle? You know, what, what, which of those is the bridge? And, um, or is it all three? Um, another thing to think about is, so we talk about transferring tokens, but, uh, you know, is one, say, token on mainnet the same value as the, on a side chain? You know, you've got different liquidity pools sizes, so it's going to be different. And, you know, is having an upgradable contract a good thing or a bad thing? And, um, you know, when is money on a bridge? Is it when the bridge contracts have access to them? And probably the big one is that last one. So if you're transferring a billion dollars, which one would you use? And of course, there are these um, design choices and things to be thought about. You know, who do you trust? And, you know, how do you, you know, how many transactions do you need to actually have these transfers go through? And who is submitting the transaction? Um, and, you know, can a user do this without having any value on the destination? What attacks are there? Yeah. So coming up, we have got a stack of talks over the next three months. I encourage you to turn up to all of them. Um, and so next is um, Raghavendra with State Expiry. So just go onto the Meetup website. So this is the Ethereum Engineering Group Meetup. Um, go onto our one. I do put some on the other um, Meetups, but not always. So for a complete list, use the Ethereum Engineering Group. And I have talked an awful lot. Um, and I don't know if I even dare to say, are there any questions? I know Mark put something in. Maybe, oh, yep, that's good. Ooh, just a sec, Sly's off. Was that you, Sly, saying something awfully quietly? There's a question for you in the chat. Oh. Okay. Is it? All right. So, how, how do you so, transfer $1 billion? I don't have a billion dollars. Oh. The problem, you know, I think if, 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 if good problems to have, probably, I don't know, is it having a billion dollars a good thing or a bad thing? I'd probably give some of it away or do some, I do some community. It's only a few Bitcoin, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's all, all, all good funny fun, isn't it? What do you do with a billion dollars? But yeah, I think... Um, I think realistically, transferring it incrementally might be the way to go, you know, so I know we all get hung up on Ethereum transaction costs and stuff and maybe bridge transaction costs, but if you trickle feed it at $10,000 at a time, but the big thing is you want to transfer out of the bridge because, you know, as we know from the poly network hack, you know, $600 million. You know, if it's all sitting on the bridge, then it can be taken. So, yeah. All right. Well, look, thank you, everyone, for bearing with one and a half. We have to ask Vitalik that question, right? Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't. I, I, so we've had Vitalik do a talk at one point, and um, I tried to make sure everyone steered clear of the is the ETH going up and how much ETH do you have, Vitalik? Because it feels a bit, you know, um, yeah. But I, I think you probably find he'd say, why would you transfer it onto another <laughs> platform? Yeah. yeah. I mean, the question, why would you? You don't need Well, that. you know, I, I don't think you'd transfer a billion. I can imagine, though, transferring some money onto a roll-up, you know, just to do stuff on a roll-up. But, yeah. All right. Look, thank you, everyone. Um, have a great um, two weeks. It's going to be great to hear Raghavendra in two weeks. And please um, RSVP for all the sessions. And uh, in particular, for, I'm really interested in seeing how everyone goes at the Solidity test in about two months' time. So, you know, start learning up on Solidity now, Stefan, and you'll be ready to do the Solidity recruitment test.
All right. Bye.